thanks for joining me for this presentation on syllable types or syllable patterns. Of all the presentations I ever give, of all the classes I teach, this topic always ranks very high, most popular. Educators are always like, wow, now that I know this, I can really teach reading more effectively. So let's just get into it. All right, here are a couple gold mine resources for you if you're interested in learning more after this presentation is finished. Um, we have the Beginning to Read book, I always recommend, and then we have Louisa Moltz's Letters series. Letters is an acronym for Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. And these are manuals, I don't have one here, but to build teacher knowledge. Modules 3 and, modules, and Module 10 contain the information um, with what's going on in this presentation that you can find out more. Okay, so co contrary to popular belief, English does have a pretty predictable rule-based spelling system. It was invented that way. Um, the spelling patterns and other letter sound correspondence rules do have some regularity. All right, so let's go here first. Your brain has taught itself subconsciously as a result of reading hundreds of thousands of words which letter sequences occur frequently in our English spelling system. All right, we're going to syllable patterns in a minute. All right, so give yourself something to do now. You see some words here that you've never seen before, and I want you to read them. Okay. How'd you do? When I ask people this, they say things like, well, I did it, but I, and then I say, how'd you do it? I chunked it, or something like that. And then I'll say, well, how did you know where to chunk it? How do we see the boundaries between syllables so naturally, it seems. So how did we know how to go uh, do, nis, ish, gulak, ki, bakin, yabat? Here's the answer to that question. With the millions of experiences reading words that we've had, our brains have intuited all on their own where those boundaries are, those syllable boundaries. Letters that are often next to each other will form this excitation, recognition. Letters that are rarely next to each other in our words result in rejection, inhibition. Okay, so this is actually pretty cool stuff. The word excitation is kind of funny because I imagine neurons doing like high fives or something. But seriously, our brains have seen certain letters in our, our orthography, in our spelling system for our language, so often that the brain says, yes, these two go together. We see it and they're recognized as uh, belonging together, so to speak. All right. Conversely, in our English spelling system, in our orthography, there are letters that we don't often see next to each other in words, single words, single syllable words. And I can't think of any single syllable words with D and Z together, but in Polish or Hungarian, this is probably common. But wait, do they really never go together in our language? Hmm. Well, skilled readers with years of experience with print their brains notice that some frequently occurring letter pairings are seen within syllables and that some don't appear between syllables. So there's D and Z together at the bottom, say in the word gadzooks. Yes, the D and Z are together, but the brain recognizes that this is a place that is a boundary and it separates them for us. It sub subconsciously chunked these syllables for us, gadzooks. We didn't have to think about it. Unfortunately, unskilled readers' brains have not internalized this, and so when we tell them to chunk it, they don't perceive these boundaries clearly like we do. Where do I chunk it? This requires some instruction on our part. <clears throat> there was a really clever uh, experiment done by Muhort in 1974, and he presented a multisyllabic word one letter at a time, left to right, just one two hundredth of a second. So you'd see the first letter and then the second would appear as the first disappeared and so on. And when the appearance of the letters was delayed like this, even for one two hundredth of a second, word recognition all but disappeared. When the letters were presented immediately, so that there was no delay between the one, the first and the next, skilled readers of course recognized it instantaneously. So seeing just one letter at a time didn't allow the brain to do something important, to form those recognition linkages between the letters. It couldn't get that excitation between a consonant and a vowel, or a consonant and a consonant, the connection patterns that it looks for. <clears throat> a pretty cool experiment. And why do we care about it? I care, I think it's cool, but otherwise, 
When you've seen a struggling reader who doesn't have automatic fluent letter recognition and they try to sound out one a word one letter at a time, <clears throat> their brains aren't forming any recognition linkages. They're, it's tedious. The brain is focusing on producing the sounds. What's this letter make? What's this letter make? It's not forming those connections of excitation yet. Um, so this phenomena of two consonants together is useful in instruction, as you're going to see in later slides. But first, let's pay attention to syllables, in particular the role that vowels play in syllable patterns. Okay. All right. So one of the first things to do is to make sure that students have a real good knowledge of vowel sounds and they pay attention to the vowels when decoding. Too often we focus on the first sounds in our instruction and this leads to that hot potato guess reading. You know, look at the first letter or two and then guess. All right, so with some readers who are having a really, or you know, like a particularly difficult time at the beginning, especially when with blending, we see this all over, I'll have them look at the word and just say the vowel sound first and then read the word. So I'll have them look at pat and say, ah, Pat. Sometimes this is enough to help them read the word more together automatically instead of sound by sound um, when they read a word. So again, just the vowel first and then the rest of the word. Struggling readers typically have difficulty with vowels in words. Consonants are easier. And this severely impacts the reading of single syllable and multisyllabic words. Again, you see it all the time. They become guessers. They become avoiders. Obviously, as you can see from this sentence, the vowels are important. The good news is if you know the syllable patterns, you can teach them to your students easily, and this will help to literally wire their brains to read syllables accurately, to chunk, and recognize those boundaries in longer words. All right. So we have 26 letters, and mostly because of the vowels, the 26 letters create 44 sounds. And mostly because of the vowels, we have dozens and dozens of ways to spell those sounds. I'm going to pause here for a bit to allow you to try something. This is a great way to see that when we make the vowel sounds in our mouths, we don't really move our mouths very much, just the slightest movement. No teeth, no tongue, no lips. So starting at the top left of this triangle shape, say just the vowel sounds of the words and, and work down and then back up again. Notice there is just the tiniest subtle change in your mouth with each progression. Actually, I'll do it with you. E, I, A, 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 I, A, 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 O, U, U, U. So there you go. If you look at the multisyllabic words on this slide, you'll see that none of those syllables are real words. None of them. It is very important that students learn to decode because reading multisyllabic words uh, means you have to have a brain that recognizes the syllable boundaries and you have to have a brain that can look at words that aren't real, non-words, like sib and nas and ment without any hesitation or tension. Without a strategy or an ability for a brain to chunk into manageable parts, students might look at a longer word, guess what it is, look at just the beginning first few letters or skip it. So familiarity with syllable spelling conventions helps readers with vowels. Familiarity with syllable patterns helps students to read long words accurately and fluently and solve spelling problems. Okay, so as promised, here are the syllable patterns. There's only six and it's really easy to teach them to educators um, and it's very easy to teach them to students. A lot of people say, why didn't I ever learn this? <laughs> All right, first one, closed syllables, first pattern. They have one vowel, and they're called closed syllables because that one vowel is closed in or followed by one or more consonants. The single one vowel makes a short sound. It does not make the sound of its name. <clears throat> so the table on this slide features some examples of closed syllable words. The top row is there to show that the syllable can be closed, the vowel can be closed in, even if there's nothing before the vowel. So what matters here is what comes after the vowel. It's closed in after. It can be one, it can be two or three consonants. So don't teach students that a closed syllable 
has a vowel in the middle of something because there might not be anything at the beginning of that vowel or in front of it. All right, the second row on this table shows your typical CVC pattern that we're all used to, and the third shows more complex closed syllables. Uh, these feature blends and digraphs. Why don't you stop here? A blend, remember, or a digraph is two letters that make one sound. Sh, th, ch, k, p, h, w, h, so on. Um, they make a whole new sound together when they're together. Blends, on the other hand, there are also two consonants together, but they're different because the two letters keep their sounds. The word blend has two blends in it to help you out and remember this. A BL at the front and an ND at the end. Um, so to help you remember something here, I have a metaphor. Students are fascinated um, when I compare the consonant that follows this one vowel to a bully. The vowel is terrified of the bully. It can't say its name because the consonant is standing there making it go eh, 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 scary. And notice the last column features um, the vowel Y. It's also a in closed syllables and it says eh. Okay. So here's some examples showing that many words are comprised solely of closed syllables. There are just five examples here. Um, but there are many, many more. It's great to teach students the concept of closed syllables, one vowel closed in by one or more consonants. The vowel makes it short sound. And you know what? You can read this long word here because you know that rule. These words are just a bunch of closed syllables that you can read all put together. So upset, fantastic, insipid, wow. Um, open syllables. They're the opposite of closed syllables. Once again, they have just one vowel, but this time the vowel is what ends the syllable. It's not closed in by a consonant, it's open. So as a result, the vowel has confidence. It's not intimidated by any consonants bullying it, bullying it or closing it in. It can say its name, okay, one vowel at the end. There aren't very many standalone syllable, single syllable words that are open. Me, he, she, go, so, so not many. The table here shows only two rows of very simple words. And the bottom row has digraphs and blends. And again, Y is in the last column. And it says the long I now when it's in an open syllable. Open syllable. So let's continue the silly metaphor. We can demonstrate to the students that when there is not a bully consonant following that vowel, it feels free and it's open and it likes to proudly state its name. I am wonderful. Oh, look at me. You never saw a vowel as wonderful as me. <laughs> so it's only when those bully consonants are closing it in that it squeaks and has to be afraid and say a short sound. All right, here, multisyllabic words featuring open syllables. Uh, the first two examples, silo, halo, have two open syllables. And the remaining examples start to show you the beauty of teaching syllable types. After teaching just two simple types, patterns, open and closed, look at the kind of words that students can decode. There are thousands, and they aren't just for young elementary aged readers. Even teaching high school students and adults who have had difficulty with the syllable patterns can become very relevant and when using mature words like violent, calculus, humanistic. All right, the third syllable type, silent E. We're all familiar with this one. It has one vowel followed by one consonant and followed by an E, and the E is silent. Okay, so there are exceptions to this a little bit, such as when the consonant is a V, give, shove, have, because sometimes those vowels aren't long, but for the most part, with single syllable words and most multisyllabic words, this is a good reliable pattern. All right, I like to officially call these syllables vowel consonant E syllables because that's what it is, a vowel, a consonant, and an E, but silent E is easier to say. So the silent E makes the si single vowel that comes first say its long sound. It serves a purpose too in, last, in the last syllable pattern we'll see in a little bit, but it keeps words too from looking like plurals or verbs. So for example, the word moose, why is there an E there? It has to be there or else it would look like moose. But here we see a very simple silent E set of words on the top of this table, no consonants before the vowel. And the second row, simple again, and then the third row has those blends and digraphs. So you can see they become more sophisticated as we, we can teach them this way. All right, now we know three syllable types. We can decode even more multisyllabic words. Again, top row, 
consists of just silent E, homemade, pine cone, sunrise, has a closed and a silent E, um, inundate, closed, closed, silent E, symbolize, closed, open, and silent E. There's our three types we've learned. Okay, so as soon as two vowels are next to each other, you automatically have a vowel team. First time we've talked about two vowels together. This is a simple concept to teach. Two vowels make one sound together. But before we look at examples, a couple things to consider. Do not teach that when two vowels go walking, the first one does the talking because that's not even true 50% of the time. Like the vowel team, ooh, as in boot. If a child were to follow that rule of the first one talking, that business, the ooh would be pronounced as o, oh, and the child would misread the word as boat instead of boot. So another thing to keep in mind, diphthongs. Those are the vowel teams oi and ow, because when we say them, we glide from one sound to another with our mouths. They, we have to move our mouth to say it, ow, oi. And some kids might hear two sounds there, so I want you to be alert of that, and that's why you might see some spelling words. That's why just those two do are diphthongs. Okay, the only unfortunate thing about vowel team syllables uh, that we can't just teach it like a pattern like we did for the first three syllable patterns. We have we and we can't have them just say, oh I know the rule and I'll go do it with everything. With vowel teams we actually have to teach the individual sounds made by each one in isolation and in words and in text, you know, and point them out all the time. It takes a little while. On this slide I've laid out most of the vowel teams in alphabetical order. Some are really uncommon and some are very common. And, and this would not be the order to teach them in. No, no, no. Whatever program you're using is going to have a sequence with the easiest and most common ones first. Um, and the vowel teams here that I put an asterisk next to indicate that they make more than one sound. They might even make uh, three sounds. All right, this chart, really comprehensive list of the sounds that the vowel teams make. If you look at the top middle row, you'll see all the ways to spell a, that sound, using vowel teams. Uh, I, this is really handy, um, especially when you come to a really rare one and if you're tempted to teach it as like an exception or a rule breaker. I adapted this list from a similar one developed by the Ebley program, Evidence-Based Literacy Instruction. You can look them up. And the examples at the top of each list are the most common ways to spell the sounds. Um, as they go down to the bottom of each list, they're more rare. Keep in mind there's other ways to spell these sounds that aren't vowel teams. So if A can be spelled with a silent E like in cake. I just like to keep lists of these when I teach so I can see how often they come up, um, when there are exceptions, and I can show students um, examples of words that have that vowel team on a moment's notice. Um, notice how W functions as a vowel in words like saw or grow. How G and H function as vowels in words like fight or through, F-I-G-H-T. In these instances, those consonants are working with a vowel to make a vowel sound, so they are part of a vowel team. They don't make that usual consonant noise, just a breathy vowel. Okay. All right, here are some um, single syllables with vowel teams in them, so that's pretty easy to understand. And here we're combining four kinds of syllable types exponentially more words are now accessible to our students. If you've got a discerning eye too, um, you'll notice that the last word, neighborhood, has a syllable type we haven't covered yet, so let's go to that one. All right, vowel plus R. It's sometimes called R controlled, tricky R, bossy R. And we're back to looking for just one vowel again. And this time though, the next letter is an R. And the vowel's not going to say the a ah or the a, it's not going to say long or short, it's going to kind of growl. Um, this is the vowel plus r syllable. And if we carry on that bullying metaphor that kids seem to be thrilled with, the r is the ultimate one. It insists on playing like a pirate game, no matter what the vowel wants to do. It's bossy, and so the vowels have to go r, er, or, and so on, growly. All right. Again, examples on a chart, both simple in the top, blends and digraphs on the bottom. Um, people get confused with R controlled because it looks like a closed syllable, it looks like one vowel closed in by a consonant, but if that consonant is an R, you know this is the syllable pattern you're talking about, the R controlled. Okay, 
Oh, and our controlled can be taught before vowel teams. There's no, I mean, depends on your program. So this isn't any particular order. Here we are, open, silent E, vowel team, closed, syllables, all combined with our controlled. Closed, syrup, harvest, the vest is closed. Open, porcupine, carbohydrate, silent E, um, turnstile, and porcupine has a silent E. Um, so finally, kids who are having a struggle with these long words, these patterns give us a way, them a way to attack, attack them. Their brains are actually rewiring to notice how words work instead of guessing. All right, the last one, consonant plus L-E. Even the word syllable has one at the end, and that's where this kind, this pattern, always appears, at the end of words that are two or more syllables. And this is the first pattern that doesn't have any focus on the vowel. The rule is one consonant followed by an L and an E, and that's it. Earlier I said that there were other functions of E in English, so when they invented our spelling system, they said, hmm, we have to put an E here on this one because every syllable has to have a vowel. Let's just stick it there, even though it doesn't make any sound. So we're saying bull, full, goal, and so on, but not pronouncing that E. All right, examples. Students who are taught to pronounce them as bull, coal, dull, full, and so on, and then um, they see that the consonant le is at the end of the word. We tell them chop it off and just read what's left. So I started filling in this chart so that the top word, if I chop off the consonant le at the end, a closed syllable remains. The second word in each list is an open syllable You just when you chop off the consonant and the le. And the third one are vowel teams once you remove the consonant le. And of course, the fourth words in each one, if there is one, is an R controlled. So just have students take that off and raise what's left. Okay, so many of you, all well and good, right? But how do students know where to divide syllables? Because you told us they aren't good at that. Um, how are they going to decode them if they don't know where to divide? Okay, we have six simple rules. And the good news is, um, these are just for you really, five of them are easy and really obvious. Rule one, compound word, divide between them. Well, what if the student can't read either of those compound words? No worries. The next rule is going to help us with that. All right, when there are two consonants between two vowels, we divide between those two consonants, just split there. So between the two T's in butter, and between the N and the V in anvil, and then you read what's left, um, closed syllables. Okay, and the U in butt has to be short because there's a T uh, closing it off. Um, this rule of dividing between the consonants also solved the question in rule one of where to divide between the um, compound words too. All right, rule three. It's the only one that really requires us to stop and think for a second, I think. Um, bonus and planet. Here we have just ends in between two vowels, so where do we decide, divide? Um, there's nothing to divide between. Well, we have to just say to kids, all right, now we got to be flexible. Let's try it one way first, and if that doesn't sound like a real word, let's go the other way. So if bonus and planet were to be divided incorrectly, the resulting syllable types would have us read them like this, bon us and planet. It's important to understand one of the beautiful things of syllable types. Most students, if they were to have read bonus incorrectly as bon us, they might immediately say, oh, I heard it, it was bonus. Bonus and bonus, close approximate approximations to each other, so the student's likely going to correct it as they're trying it the wrong way. But the word has to be in their vocabulary, right? Okay. Rule four, we just learned a few slides ago. As soon as we see consonant plus L-E, we cut it off and we read what's left. Rule five, prefixes and suffixes get cut off. Um, we might have to do some instruction on prefixes and suffixes or some of them actually follow syllable types like re as in repeat, pre as in preheat, open syllables. Many suffixes are closed syllables. It's rule six now. The thing to remember here is not to divide between the letters of those digraphs, ch, th, sh. So we just have to tell the students what those digraphs are and they don't divide there. All right, so what happens now, some exceptions, what if there's three consonants and none of them are a digraph? Well, some programs will tell students, 
Keep the two letter blend in place. It's the most popular one. Well, how do I know? In spectrum, I see CT, and that happens in the word like act. And in spectrum, I see TR, that happens in the word like trip. It doesn't really work here for me. So I just tell students, if it's not obvious, divide it somewhere between those three. Just choose somewhere and try it out. And it usually works either way. So spectrum, they could say spectrum or spectrum. Either way, it'll get them there. Transport, transport. <laughs> They're going to hear the word transport either way they go. And again, it has to be in their vocabulary before, so it'll ring bells. All right, people will sometimes say to me, okay, I see we divide between the two D's in riddle to make rid and dull, but I don't say rid dull. When I say it, I say riddle. And then you used to have a hard time explaining it. So I really like the wording in Motes and Tolman's explanation here. Spoken syllable divisions often don't coincide with or give rationale to the conventions of written syllables. So the way we say it is the way we say it. And the way we read it and convert it into speech is going to be a little different. Yes, we say riddle. But the spelling convention with those two D's there, that double D, and other such patterns were invented by people to help them say, hmm, our speech is not always going to correspond to how we decode, but that's okay. Um, it'll help alert, that D's there to help alert the child to make that I say it in riddle. So they invented these weird little spelling rules to help us sound things out. Pretty neat. All right, and it's not always perfect. Um, students are going to make an error with a letter sound. They're going to um, make a syllable division spot wrong, or they're going to put emphasis on the wrong syllable. But when they blend it all together, they're often able to get to the word, especially if it's in their long-term memory, if they've heard it before. It has to be in their vocabulary. I keep saying this, hint, hint. Okay, so for example, familiar. Um, they might divide familiar incorrectly and read it familiar or something like that. Familiar. Familiar. Oh, familiar, yes. Triumphant. They might go triumphant because they see A-N-T at the end, like ant. Um, triumphant. But that's going to sound very close to a word they might know, triumphant. So the syllable types get them there after all, even if they're not 100%. So what do students need to have to learn the patterns? I think it goes without saying the first thing they have to do is be proficient with letter sounds. It's going to be really hard to learn how to read vowel teams if you don't know what those vowel teams are and the AU says all. Another requirement is phoneme awareness. Really, really need to watch the presentation in this series on the why and how of building proficiency with phoneme awareness. So simply put, for the purposes we have here, if the brain can process and manipulate phonemes so well that it's doing so at a subconscious level, connecting the phonemes of the letters that the student sees in words, it's going to anchor it in their memory. Okay, so no presentation on syllable patterns would be complete if I didn't include a bit on schwa. Odd word, schwa. But it's, a schwa is a vowel sound. It's the sound of a uh or i eh that happens in a long word. Where in the long word? In the syllables that we don't stress, the quiet syllables. Some people call a schwa the lazy vowel, and any vowel can be a lazy vowel, A-E-I-R-U. Pause here for a moment, or come back to it, to read the examples on this page. I've underlined the schwa to draw your attention to it, but you can see we say it either a uh or i. Eh. Right, so why is this good to know? Because students will make a lot of spelling errors. When they go to decode, the words might sound a little off. For example, in the word human, when decoding it, the student might come up with human, but we really pronounce it human, I, 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 the A saying I. No big deal again, though, because human and human sound so much alike. The student's probably going to get it correct, and especially if they're reading in connected text. Huge victory, though, over how many of these kids how they used to read by just looking at the letter or two and guessing it based on context when they got it wrong all the time. All right, so as you teach syllable patterns, you're going to find phonic elements to instruct along the way. You'll pick things up. For example, C and G. I'm throwing this in here. Whenever C and G are followed by an E, I, or Y, they make soft sounds. C sounds like S, which is in its name, C. 
G sounds like J, which is in its letter name, J, J, G. So to learn these rules, and there really aren't that many, again, go back to those two letters modules from Moats that I suggested on the second slide to reinforce some of the stuff here. There's a lot of practice sheets in those modules that you can get to solidify stuff, and there's always Google in the meantime if you're not sure why certain letters do certain things, or you can contact me. All right. Many instructional and intervention programs have a scoping sequence that use these syllable patterns. That's what they, how they teach. They're here, listed here. This is not an exhaust, exhaustive list, but it's a really good start. If you're teaching the syllable patterns and you're wondering, where do I find lists of words? Internet. It's invaluable until you come up with a set of sources. Um, Scrabble Fiends, oh, their websites do us a huge favor here. Um, don't teach decoding of syllables in isolation, please. Make sure to have students practice learning to read these words in connected text, too, so they are learning to generalize what you just taught them in a lesson. Decodable text, this is the tool to use deliberately for this purpose. And there's so many wonderful, really highly engaging decodable texts that have informa informative elements and stuff now. They're not, they're, yeah, they're constrained to help kids practice silent E and such, but all beginning texts are constrained in one way or another. Don't dismiss them as boring because, you know, they're not going to have engaging prose, whether it's leveled or decodable, either way. And the reason, I tell students, the reason we're using these sentences is to practice the AU vowel team, or we're practicing this book because it's got silent E, let's look for it. Okay, so authentic literature, I just got to put it out there too, we should read that too always and then when we come upon an unknown word stop dry erase board and help them divide it and decode it look here's our syllable types where would you divide talk to me why are you what are you thinking if 86 percent of words can be decoded based on six syllable patterns uh, it's worth giving them a try um, and it would also help to watch the presentation i have in here on irregular words too all right i really thank you I, um, it's fast, it's furious, but thank you for participating in this um, fun presentation on syllable types and syllable, syllable division. I hope I whet your appetite to learn more. It's a really popular topic because it does so much to help kids really unlock that code. All right, thank you. Keep learning. Mm -hmm.